And then the rainstorm came over me. And I felt my spirit break. I had lost all of my belief, you see. And realized my mistake. But time through a prayer to me and all around me became still. I need Give me now, I see that I've been blind. Give me love, love is what I need to help me know my name. Through the rainstorm came sanctuary. I wanted to take you through the process of discovery uh, as uh, this just happened two days ago and now I'm putting this video documentary together uh, to throw it out there and see what you all think about it and uh, sharing it with others and they're finding much interest as well but uh, you know this is how we discover this is how we're learning this is how we're growing this is how it works so uh, for me anyway so I wanted to show um, you what happened to for me to learn this stuff and and uh, find a, a, what I think is one of the most amazing discoveries in uh, uh, of our of our true uh, 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 cosmos uh, and in this uh, earthly realm. Uh, so I got a comment on my YouTube channel from a B Edgar, uh, and it said simply this: A column is a basic unit of electrical charge. We are columns colonized by Christopher Columbus. We live in the United States. Which states of matter are they talking about? The seen and unseen. The late Lady Liberty brings us light, also known as Lucifer, Apollo, and Diana Lucifera. Uh, and if you know, Statue of Liberty was a Freemason gift from the to the Freemasons and put on water because we're under maritime law. Uh, going under, going forward, seems we are batteries in a matrix. However, that was that was not how it was originally intended. We are electric beings and are able to connect on quantum levels to our surrounding nature. Our potential is being systematically come, come cut off from us. At full potential. We could communicate with our earth and heal all things. They say that there is a secret word for that connection, like tapping into the matrix computer. Of course, we don't have access to that word. To me, it is probably along the lines of um or um, but we don't have the rest of it, like a password to the earth ship system. Hmm. So then I went and I got on Wikipedia and I looked up Charles Augustine Columbine to learn what he's talking about here. Um, just like a lot of other discoveries we've been making and that, you know, that font of all knowledge, Wikipedia, you know, 80% true. So let's find out what some of the truth is. So Augustine was a French physicist. He was best known for developing Columb's law, the definition of electrostatic force of attraction and repulsion, repulsion, but also did important work on friction. Hmm. The SI unit of electrical charge, the Columb, was named after him. Now, I'm not a science guy. I'm just learning all this with you guys. So one thing I'm finding out about the, our electromagnetic universe, it, it is elegantly simple, not complicated to understand. Even I can understand it. So let's read a little further here. Uh, he discovered first an inverse relationship of the force between electric charges and the square of its distance and the same relationship between magnetic poles. 
Uh, later it was named after him. His name is one of 72 names inscribed on the Eiffel Tower. Um, reading further down about his law here. We find his law is the inverse square law, a law of physics that describes the force interacting static electrically charged particles. The first law was published in 1784, essentially a development of theory of electromagnetism. Boy, I got excited when I read that. The law has been tested heavily, and all observations have upheld the law's principles. Well, when I think about Jordan Maxwell, and he was telling me about the elections, the electoral, the electrons, the poles, and the poles, the voting and the volting, and that we charging the candidate. So then I went and looked up candidate, and what did I find? One aspiring to office to make white or bright. And, uh, office seekers in ancient Rome were white togas. Uh, white from Latin, white, pure, sincere, honest, upright. Uh, to glow, to shine. So, reading further down, uh, the magnitude of the electrical sta electrostatic force of interaction between two point charges is directly proportional to the scalar multiplication of the magnitude of the charges and inversely, inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. The force along the straight line joining the, the force is along the straight line joining them. If the two charges have the same sign, the electrostatic force between them is repulsive. If they have different signs, the force between them is attractive. According to this law, if two charged bodies are kept at a certain distance, they will experience an attractive or repulsive force depending upon the nature of their charges. If the bodies are charged by similar electrical charge, they will repel each other. If the bodies are charged by opposite electrical charge, they will attract each other. Similarly, if you increase the charge Q2, keeping Q1 unchanged, the force between them is again increased. If you decrease the charge Q2, keeping Q1 unchanged, the force is obviously decreased. According to Coulomb's law, force F between them is directly proportional to either Q1 or Q2, or in other words, F is proportional to the product of Q1 and Q2. Now, by keeping their charge fixed at Q1 and Q2, if we bring the charged bodies nearer to each other, the force between them increases. And if we take them away from each other, the force between them decreases. If the distance between their centers is R, it can be proved that force acting on them is inversely proportional to R square. It is also obvious that this force is not same for every medium. For example, if the bodies are kept in air, the force is different from the force while they are kept in water. Variation of force according to the medium is determined by a constant, say this is K. Finally, we can say that force F equals Q1 into Q2 divided by K into R square. This is nothing but the expression of Coulomb's law. Okay, what they're describing, folks, is a magnet. Magnets positive to positive push away, positive to negative attract. That's all they're saying here, basically. And they're talking about the ether in between, the friction in between. Uh, and, it, and it gets inversely proportional the more, the more force is applied. So by electricity, uh, 1600, discovered, uh, coined by a guy named William uh, Gilbert, English guy, static electricity, uh, coined the word electrus. And in 1785 is when Charles Augustine de Colum, we need to know this name, published his first three reports on electricity and magnetism where he stated his law. Now notice it's not a book. These were only papers. Uh, the scientism of today, the, the Newtonians and Copernicuses and the Einsteinonians and all the rest of these guys, oh, we had books and all this stuff. Well, this gentleman never got to, uh, got to write a book about it. Uh, but it was on the theory of electromagnetism, and he used torsion balance toroidal balance to study the repulsion and attraction forces of charged particles. 
and determine that the magnitude of the electric force between two point charges is directly proportional to the products of charges and inversely proportional to the square of distance between them. Again, magnets. The law of superposition, superposition allows Columbine's law to be extended to include any number of point charges. Here's where it gets good. It's scalable. It's anti-Newtonian. This is my words. Anti-Newtonian theory of size matters. Remember oceans were pulled up and down allegedly by the one-sixth gravity pull of uh, the Earth's gravity with, uh, by the moon and is moving the tides up and down twice a day while the Earth is on its back spinning at a thousand miles an hour, which means the gravity has to pull even greater to hold the oceans in that the moon's pulling on because the, it's on its backside at 23 and a half degrees. That's our story today. But here, the old story going back to ancient times, was that it was scalable from the smallest to the vast largeness. Interesting, right? Continuous charge distribution. In this case, the principle of linear, linear super, superposition is also used. For a continuous charge distribu distribution, an integral over the region containing the charge dome is equivalent to an infinite summation. Infinite summation treating each infinitesimally, infinitesimal element of space as a point of charge. The distribution of charge is usually a linear, surface, or volumetric. Covers everything, folks, and get this. Ready for it? Conditions for valid, valid, validity. There are two conditions to be fulfilled for the validity of Cullum's Law. The charge considered must be point charges, positive and negative, or positive and positive. They should be stationary. Can you say flat earth? Electrostatic approximation. When movement takes place, magnetic fields that alter the force of the two objects are produced. Now, folks, here is the design he made, the model of an inverted Coulomb electromagnetic experiment device. Now, before I show you next, can you recognize anything? Do you see this here? Do you see this here? Do you see this here? This is the device he used to prove the electromagnet electromagnetic forces of static and friction between objects. Now, if we add this and take this, we have the North Pole and invert it. We have the North Pole charge here. We have the Antarctic circle of the, of the other charge here. I think this is positive and the North Pole is negative, but I'm not sure. This is this electromagnetic torsion device from 1785. Here's the flat plane Earth. Here's your sun and moon. Here's the geodesic dome. It all, all works, folks. Now, here's another picture of one of his uh, working models. And here we see the heavens, the North Pole, the sun circling above, the dome, and the realms of heaven above the dome. This was his electromagnetic and magnetism experiment. All right, so then I started questioning, well, where's this guy, Columb? Where's the, what's named? Columbus. Well, is that what Washington District of Columbia is named after? The Columbia Disaster. Columbia, the CBS all-seeing eye. Columbia University, founded by the Hoff Juden Court, Rock, uh, Court Hoff Juden Rockefellers, who work for the Jesuits, or Columbine University. Now, would they be making fun of us by saying the electromagnet magnetism is the realm of existence that we are in in our cosmology today, and they're making mocking us by naming the District of Columbia? I'm going to get into that in part two much deeper, but just wanted to plant that into your heads. All right, let's move on. Coulomb's torsion balance. Charles Augustine de Coulomb measured the magnitudes of the electric forces between charged objects using the torsion balance which he invented. A scale that is circumscribed on the glass case is used to measure the torsion produced in the fiber. Let us see how Charles Augustine de Coulomb deduced the famous Coulomb's law. In order to study the intensity of the interaction force between two charged bodies, the brass disc was made to touch a small metal sphere, which was at the end of a glass rod suspended from a hole in the glass lid of the balance. Coulomb observed that the thread suspended from the needle did not move as both the disc and the sphere are without charge. The sphere suspended from the lid of the balance was removed and charged. He placed the sphere back into the balance. The sphere and the brass disc repelled each other as the disc attained the same charge as the sphere. As a result, 
the needle started oscillating. The torsion angle of the thread was measured using the degree scale marked on the glass case. In order to ascertain the ratio between the interaction force and the electrical charge on the bodies, Coulomb removed the sphere suspended from the glass rod and placed in contact with another sphere of the same size. As a result, the charge of the sphere was reduced to half. The sphere was placed back into the balance. It was observed that the electric repulsion between the charged bodies was less. He then calculated the ratio between the interaction force and the electrical charge on the bodies by measuring the angle of torsion. Coulomb found that the force between two point charges was directly proportional to the product of magnitude of two charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Now that we have an understanding of the basic mechanics of uh, Coulomb's law, let's like a, take a look at the ancient cosmology uh, throughout history and we see very, very similar patterns. Here's a Tonka from uh, Buddhist. Here's the realms, the different heavenly realms. Uh, again, this is the model of an inverted Coulomb's law uh, device that he, he made that uh, shows the different realms of the heavenly realms, the earthly realm, and the hell realms. Here we see the Old Testament, and it matches up perfectly, perfectly with the center pole diode and the outer rim uh, opposite charge, repulsion, and attraction. Here's uh, Buddhism, the seven different realms of their, of their uh, cosmology existence. Uh, and they also have stupas, which are called stupas and temples in Tibet, <clears throat> which are dedicated to this ancient cosmology of belief of what the actual, uh, our universe, our earthly realm is about in the realms above and below. And we see it over and over and over again, from the Chaldeans to the Jains to the Sumerians to the uh, Babylonians to the Egyptians. Uh, across the pond, we have the Toltecs, the Aztecs, the Mayans, uh, all their cultures, the native Indians, the Cherokees, the Aztecs as well, all had the exact same ancient cosmology for over 5,000 years that we were geocentric and that the universe was centered around us and Mother Earth. And they have been taken that away. And they have tell us that we're not important, we're not relevant, we're just one of billions and billions. Now here is a motor, electric motor, and you can see again the charges. The arctic circle you can see around is one charge and then coming up through the middle is another charge. Basic, elegant, beautiful, and simple by design. And then we have the toroidal uh, sphere, the fields of energy fields, and again these pictures match up perfectly. Uh, and one of the most beautiful, I think, is the ancient Scandinavian uh, Norwegian uh, designs. This is the Yardasol egg with the sphere, the electromagnetic field around, the tree of knowledge, the tree of good and evil, uh, and the different realms again, the heavenly realm, the earthly realm, and the hell realm, all existing in a floating plane in one of just many spheres of infinitesimal, infinitesimally small and infinitesimally large. And throughout them all, you have the, the tree of life, uh, the tree of knowledge, tree of good and evil as well. As above, so below. We are part of the cosmos. We are not apart from the cosmos. Now, my buddy Bruce at the geo, uh, Gnostic, um, uh, geocentric Gnostic.com, uh, he took the Yardasol egg and inverted it and came up with a very clever uh, piece that maybe makes a lot of sense. And here's the electronic, uh, electrical magnetic field you can see. And then he in inserted a flat earth and showed how the Arctic Circle would fit in there perfectly. And then he got the idea to take a look at the United Nations, which is a flat earth map. And he put it inside and looked at the, look at the laurel wreaths outside. That's the electromagnetic field inside the 33 degree Freemasons inside a flat earth. Now, is that just a coincidence? I don't think so. So now let's take a look at the dome. Uh, as we see again in many ancient cosmologies, they all had a, a dome motif or a sphere of influence. Um, 
and we can see that in the many different cultures. Again, here's Columb's device, and here we have the Aurora Boris, the snake that eats the tail in a continuing infinitesimal loop, uh, the turtle theme, the elephant theme. Uh, they both play on both ends of the, of, of the earth, um, and they both have this same type of uh, electromagnetic energetic force field that surrounds us all and provides us all with the electrical frequencies and vibrations that Nikola Tesla says is the basic makeup of all cosmos. And it shows over and over and over again in the, all the different ancient cultures, not all, but many different ancient cultures, the same type of existence of a dome. And uh, once, once you start seeing this in many different cultures, you understand that we have been lied to for 500 years, and this lie is ending right now. We are beginning to discover our true nature again. We're reconnecting with our ancient ancestors, and we're rediscovering that not only are we uh, the most important uh, co-creation in uh, the source, God, whoever you want to call it, that uh, is part of this creative, creative creature of creation that we are, um, we're all part of this involved in a in inside a dome, inside a, a a sphere of electromagnetism. And it's absolutely beautiful how it's expressed in all these ancient cult, uh, cultures. And it's absolutely criminal how they've hidden from us our true existence about our true nature. And the good news is it's ending now. And you that are watching this are all part of the awakening. We're all awakening together in unity. It's a beautiful thing. So let's get a little more into the dome. Let's get a little more into Nikola Tesla uh, and what he was about. He created this thing called the Tesla Shield back in 1905, 1920. He uh, created, uh, he discovered, rediscovered Wi-Fi, the radio. Marconi stole it from him. He had a doomsday device. He had a, he had devices where we had free energy, which the military has, and they've never allowed us uh, uh, to use it since 1920s. Um, and he was working on the principle of electromagnetic energy. Um, and here's another drawing um, showing how the pressure works and how the electromagnetic dome would function. Here is a picture from uh, a Tesla coil showing the uh, Antarctic Circle and the North Pole in, in the middle. Uh, and here's a picture of bending light. Fr uh, Fraud Einstein bending light stole this from... Uh, from the Tesla technology and made it his own, or again, around the 1920s as well. Um, and I can have more about that later. But uh, let's let's get into the dome and what the dome could be made of, how it could be, and, and we'll show uh, a little bit of, of uh, video of, of how it could possibly work uh, in this realm, that uh, this earthly realm that we live in. Let's uh, get into the physics and mechanics of how an electromagnetic dome uh, might possibly work, how the tides uh, might move up and down an electromagnetic field, as well as uh, how a magnet uh, of a central pole with a positive and a negative uh, field, circle field would also work, as well as what would be holding up the uh, sun and the moon while it rotated around uh, in the sky above us between uh, 700 miles and 3,000 miles above. Uh, Tesla, of course, uh, developed in the 1900 free energy as well as uh, the technology we use today with Wi-Fi alternating current. He also developed a death ray and a Tesla shield dome, which we'll get into in a little bit here. Um, but before we get into that, we, we need to set the record straight a little bit here. And this credit goes to uh, Bruce at the geocentricgnostic.com. Uh, the predecessor to Nikola Tesla, uh, alive at the same time, was a man named J.J. Thompson. Uh, Thompson was awarded the 1906 Nobel Prize for Physics for the discovery of the electron and for his work on the conduction of electricity and gases. Uh, he also had uh, several students that went on to get Nobel Prizes as well. Um, the electromagnetic mass was initially a concept of classical mechanics, denoting to how much the electromagnetic field or the self-energy was contributing to the charged particles. Uh, due to the self-induction effect, electrostatic energy behaves as having some sort of momentum, uh, which apparently electromagnetic mass, which can increase the ordinary mechanical mass of bodies. 
the increase should arise from the electromagnetic self energy. So it's self creating energy. Basically, what it's tapping into is the uh, electromagnetic magnetic field that's all around us. Now, Tesla had developed what he called a Tesla shield, or what we call a Tesla shield, or a 3D scalar interferometry hemispherical shell, an impregnable shell that was to be used by the military, it could be defend anything at anywhere. Uh, and this is uh, what, he, what he took from the electromagnetic dome above. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence that uh, Tesla did uh, know about the dome. Um, now here's a picture of uh, Tesla technology in action, and you can clearly see that if the center pole was a positive, the north pole, that would be the Arctic Circle around the perimeter, the Antarctic Circle, excuse me, around the perimeter, and you can imagine the dome going up and above that. Uh, and here's another picture from below looking at the dome from above, an electromagnetic field, uh, and another picture as well. Uh, now, a magnetic dipole uh, is this technology, and here's a drawing of it, and you'll notice it, it's very much the same uh, mechanics and physics as a standard speaker you would have in a car or uh, in your home. And um, you can see here that uh, there's a center positive and then a surrounding negative around here. Uh, same way it works on the magnetic speaker with the magnet here, centralized uh, positive and then a negative field going around the speaker. So the center would be the North Pole, the Arctic, and the surrounding would be the Antarctic electromagnetic energy field. Here we see again that the ancient cosmogony reflects a uh, centralized battery pole with a 12th heaven or 7th heaven above, very similar to the speaker. Thor and his hammer, his thunder hammer, blasting through the dome, as well as lightning strikes coming from the heavens in the electrical universe. Tesla famously had his uh, electrical uh, program of free energy plug pulled by uh, J.P. Morgan, and two gentlemen, David Talbot and Walter Thornhill, have picked it up with a book and documentary called Thunderbolt of the Gods, where they uh, postulate that we do live in an electric universe based on plasma. Let's get into that a little more. So the electric universe. The electric universe is based on observations and experiment than abstract theory. It recognizes connections between diverse disciplines. It concludes that crucial requirement for understanding the universe is to take fully into account the basic electrical nature of atoms and their interactions. Strangely, this is not the case in conventional cosmology, where weaker magnetism and the infinitely weaker force of gravity rule the cosmos. Such a simplification may suit a theoretical physics based on electric neutrality of matter in earthly laboratories, but it does not apply in space where plasma dominates. Plasma has been called the fourth state of matter after solids, liquids, and gases. Most of the matter in the universe is the form of plasma. A plasma is formed and some of the negatively charged electrons are separated from the host atoms in a gas. Leaving the, leaving the atoms with a positive charge. The negatively charged electrons and the po positively charged atoms, known as, known as positive ions, are then free to move separately under the influence of an applied voltage or magnetic field. Their movement constitutes an electrical current. So one of the more important properties of plasma is that it can conduct electrical current. It does so by forming current filaments that follow magnetic field lines. Filamentary patterns are ubiquitous in the cosmos. So part of the unique behavior of plasma. Although plasma behavior follows simple electromagnetic laws, the resulting complexity continues to astonish the specialists who study it. These filaments tend to braid themselves into ropes that act as power transmission lines with virtually no limit to the distances of which they can operate. In a rarefied plasma space, the subtle flow of electricity is not easily measured, but these currents leave a definitive signature, a network of magnetic fields throughout the observed universe. Astronomers detect these fields, but give no attention to the electrical cause. Magnetic fields are produced only by electricity. The complex magnetic fields we observe are evidence that plasma is carrying electrical energy across galactic and intergalactic space, powering and organizing secondary systems. Exceedingly subtle changes and balances across the immense volume of space are quite sufficient to configure and animate cosmic structures at all scales of observation. 
to see the connection between plasma experiments and plasma formations, it is essential to understand the scalability of plasma phenomena. Under similar conditions, plasma discharge will produce the same formations irrespective of the size of the event. As above, so below. How many of us are consciously aware they were first and foremost electrical vibrational beings? How many are aware that nearly the same exact frequencies resonate in the Earth's electrical field, known as the Schumann resonance, as do humans? Our vibrational frequencies change whether we are sleeping in a calm state or in a higher vibrational, higher consciousness state of being. Here we can see Karelian photography on humans in different emotional states of consciousness. This is also evidenced as well in the energy chakras of our bodies. If you wanted to control humanity, you would simply need to change the vibrational frequency in the air around them. Few know or are aware that geoengineering practices over the past decades have been successfully used exactly for these purposes, to keep us from accessing our higher consciousness through altering of the energy fields above using HARP and over-the-counter radar for decades. Taking a little sidebar here, this is from a uh, post I did a little while ago on my blog, taboo.blog.com. Uh, and what we talk about is whether or not there was a concerted effort to put rubber soles on shoes. So you notice uh, Paul McCartney here without shoes in this famous Abbey Rhodes picture uh, to keep us from being grounded to earth, to get that connectivity between the as above uh, and so below connectivity between positive and negative so we could be closer to Mother Gaia. This is from Dr. Mercola's website. Mounting evidence suggests the Earth's negative potential can create a stable internal bioelectrical environment for the normal, fu normal functioning of all body systems. Throughout history, humans mostly walked barefoot with, or with footwear made of animal skins. They slept on the ground. Through direct contact or through perspiration, moistened animal skins used as footwear or sleeping mats, the ground's abundant free electrons were able to enter the body, which is electrically conductive. Though this mechanism, every part of the body could, could e equilibrate with the electrical potential of the earth, thereby stabilizing the electrical environment of all organs, tissues, and cells. And this quote here, first I was skeptical. I said, my gosh, putting my feet on the ground is going to improve my heart, my body, at least the things that Clint is talking about. But then I spoke to him for about an hour and went from skeptical to being all in. Look, the heart is the most electrical organ of the body. We are electric beings. So we are two-thirds water, everyone knows, which is one of the most conductive elements in nature. Additionally, Earth is more than two-thirds water. It really should be called Mother Water, not Mother Earth. Ancient cosmology, cosmology believed above the firmament was unfathomable depths of water. Again, conductivity. So let's explore the physics between how tides may work, how the sun and moon may rotate above an electromagnetic field, as well as how the firmament of electromagnetism may interact with our Earth today. In order to generate electricity, the ball would have to have enough momentum to, say, hit the arm of a paddle wheel each time it passes. And once you have an axle that turns, you have the ability to generate electricity. But the importance of Ryder's machine cannot be overstated. Over the three days it was filmed, the ball maintained a constant speed measured to 1 25th of a second. There would therefore appear to be no reason why this machine should not continue to run forever. Perpetual motion. Something that for 300 years conventional science has said is impossible. It's of the magnets. You see, if I can move it yeah. on the side, it will again pivot around the axis of the magnet because it makes sure that uh, the magnetic field inside of it stays the same. Right. It's astonishing. Can you put it on the track for us? Yeah. I just levitate it above the track quite high and I can just rotate it. So it's actually floating above the surface. Yeah, it's not floating, it's locked above the surface. So it could you could tilt it at an angle and it would yeah, still fly it around. Yeah, like this and it will just go around like this. Because it, 
go and put it at different height, put them in like this. And lock it at the height. Lock right. it, yeah, different height, different configuration. Right. And I can even lock it at the uh, opposite way. If you could just hold for a minute. Okay. Hi. I'm doing the so same thing. Hang I'm locking down. it upside down, and then it is suspended. Fantastic. Music of angels burst in my head Got a key from the elders Wake up the dead Behold sacred meaning in life And only in the last dance we shall fight And we shall win We've got a soul Circle is home. All I can do is keep my fire burning for you. To reach you before the fall. cuts away kick down all the walls that have made us slaves remember dream come on remember how heed to your freedom cause the time is now coming from the country going to the sun and we're never ever gonna rest till our songs are
Back to this theme that's been there all along, the theme of the two worlds, and then the replication of that theme in the opposites inside a person. Remember that proverb, we will become our own opposite if we don't accommodate the opposites in us. You remember that phrase, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions? It's another way of saying that. Uh, good intentions are not enough and they don't ever go far enough. As a matter of fact, they lead to the blockages on the way to the way. Something way beyond that has to happen, and Carl Jung did a lot of work with that, calling it the shadow, so that everybody at some points, at various points in their life, have to engage their, their shadow. And he called it the ethical struggle, because it's a battle inside oneself. It's the original meaning of jihad. Jihad isn't go kill the infidels. Jihad is the battle between the opposition in one's own heart. And again, you watch, it's not just the United States, it's not just Americans, and it's not just the simple European West that literalizes, because jihad has become literalized as uh, first you project the shadow onto someone else and then you attack them. Uh, we do it here, they do it there. It's very dangerous and very destructive. And it's always done to avoid the obvious issue, which is to fight the battle in here which is a much harder battle and one that everybody loses to some degree. I think it was Jung also that said something about if we don't struggle with our own dark parts and shadows, then they are projected into the world where we have to live them out as historical fate. So this is Rumi again talking about that from a different point of view. It's called Tending Two Shops. Don't run around this world looking for a hole to hide in, for there are wild beasts in every cave. Even if you live amongst mice, the cat's claws one day will find you. The only real rest comes when you're alone with God. So live in the nowhere that you came from, even if you have a good address here. It's because of this that you see things in two ways. Sometimes you look at a person and see a cynical snake. Someone else sees a joyful lover, and you're both right. Everyone is half and half, like the black and white ox. Joseph looked ugly to his brothers and most handsome to his father. And you have eyes that see from nowhere and eyes that judge distances here. How high everything is or how low, 
and you own two shops and you run back and forth from one to the other. So try closing the shop that's really a fearful trap, getting always smaller and smaller with checkmate this way and checkmate, checkmate that, and try to keep open the shop where you're not selling fish hooks anymore, where you are the free swimming fish. Is that cool or what? So there's, there he is talking about the two worlds. And so we own those two shops. That's our job. <coughs> we own the shop of, of measurement. And we own the shop of the other world, too, or at least we rent space there. And the job is to slowly give up the warehouse in this world and trade it in for the surprising territory of the other world. And, and slowly, perhaps, because if you go to the other world too fast, you don't do very well. It's like those divers that are in the deep, and then they come up suddenly, and they never are the same. And if you jump into the other world, the water's really deep. Yeah, you can get the bends if you, <laughs> the mythological bends, if you, if you try to get those depths too soon. And the regulator is the, the clumsiness of one's own life. And so what I'd like to do is give uh, some ideas about how to act when everybody thinks the world is ending and it's actually not, or why the world can't end and how you act when people think it's going to, or why the world can't end, but how do we feel, act, and see things when the ends are more evident. So the first idea in that is that the world is mythic by nature, and nature is demonstrating constantly this myth of eternal return, that the eternal keeps returning, the way nature keeps making new life from compost. You know, gardening is still the most popular uh, hobby in the United States, and I think it's a disguise for bowing to the earth. I think it's a secret way of participating in the myth of nature, the life-death renewal myth, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a hobby only because people forgot that it's a devotion. So this world is mythic by its nature. It's a great story. And it's, it's an ongoing story. And then the second part of that is each person is mythic by nature. And that if we can find our inner nature or second nature, they call it, and if we can get close to our inner nature, it turns out it gets us closer to great nature. And if we can get close to our inner nature, we also start to gather stuff about our myth, the myth we're living. That's, or really, the, to be correct, it's the myth that's living us. We're trying to grow up to the story that's already in us. And even though in the Western world we think of my life and my this and my that, it's actually the myth living us. So at the end, or seeming end, is a good time to learn from nature and to get close to one's inner nature. I guess I'm calling it part of the mythic inoculation. How not to go mad when everybody's worried about the end by staying close to one's inner nature which doesn't mind ends at all because it knows how to begin again. Uh, a mythic idea, only things that have a beginning can come to an end. As soon as people give up the notion that this world began at a certain time and realize that it's beginning all the time, myth is outside of time. Myth is that thing which breaks time, and every time time breaks, myth comes pouring in. And so in mythic sense, the world had no beginning. And as soon as the sense <coughs> arrives that it had no beginning, it becomes clear it has no end. That's a mythic notion that goes counter culture. The second part of it is that there's so many beginnings to the world that it cannot find that many ends. I mean, I study stories from all over the world, and there are seemingly endless, endless numbers of story of the beginning. So realizing how complex and magical the world actually is with its endless number of beginnings starts to create the sense that it's not going to end. I'm not saying that it isn't rough time. And I'm not also, I'm not clear, I want to be clear, I'm not saying there isn't a lot of work to do. You can turn anywhere in nature and you can turn anywhere in culture and you could go to work because the loose ends are all over the place. 
The only thing is to go do it. The rest of it is just all people, you know, judging American Idol. You try to do it in such a way that you achieve a little bit, get paid once in a while, and you try to do it in, in such a way that you feel the service quality of it, and you try to do it in such a way that it adds to your capacity to love and be loved. But basically, there's nothing better to do right now. That's what I hope is going to come from this fear of the end of the world. There's two options. The whole thing's going to end, so why bother? Or as someone said, the whole thing's going to end, I'm going to do what I need to do really right now. That's the value of the fantasy of the end, I think. Right now, everybody thinks they have no time. We've been talking about that. And uh, people can't find the time. People can't make the time. I mean, children can't make the time anymore. And in the midst of that kind of feeling, and it's rushing towards the end, and the whole thing might end, how do you act? And so there's a phrase that comes from the Renaissance in Italian where they say, festina lente, festina lente, make haste slowly. When it comes time even to contribute and to help this change that's on the front page of the paper and on the back of everybody's mind, the issue isn't to do it all right away. The issue is to make haste slowly. Mm -hmm.